Hello and welcome to A Closer Look with Mark and Mark. I'm Mark Miller and this is Mark Schein. And Mark, we are now getting into the point of the basketball season where league play starts right. to happen for about everybody, right? A few leagues have played a couple games already, but most of them open up this weekend and yep, we're into it. All right, well, let's review some games from last yep. week. Let's look at Friday, first of all, and I, I start off. I have Van Wert and Crestview. What a backdoor rivalry. It's a good game early in the season, especially. Van Wert comes away with a 48-44 win. It was a packed house, a great win for the Cougars. Jacoby Kelly was the man for Van Wert in this game. 23 points, 8 rebounds. Blake Henry, Drew Bagley, Nate Place all played integral parts in that victory. For Crestview, Jalen Etzler, the great junior, he had 15 points and 7 rebounds. Drew Klein, Wade Sheets also uh, going to be, uh, both these teams are going to have really yeah. good years. Then on Saturday, Crestview came back out a win over Parkway to go 1-1. One and one. But what a big win for the Van Wert Cougars to start the season off. And maybe a little bit tough for Crestview, you know, kind of coming out of football. This is your first game and you're playing a backyard rival like that. And maybe ran out of gas a little bit in the fourth quarter, but certainly came back and played well then on Saturday night. It's a good win yep, for Van sure Wert. Look at that crowd. Yeah, how about that? That's a great way to start it out, isn't it? Yep. Well, let's move on. Let's go to Fort Recovery and Delphus Jefferson. Well, this is overtime night. The JV game went double overtime, and the varsity game ends up going overtime, too. Fort Recovery wins the first quarter 16-11. Jefferson wins the middle two quarters. Fort Recovery comes back to win the fourth quarter by two. And then in overtime, it's 14-3. Fort Recovery in the overtime period. Grant Kanapke, what a nice sophomore he has. Nine points in fourth quarter, including in the overtime, excuse me, including five of six from the free throw line. Delphus Jefferson was affected a little bit. Davion Tyson, one of the better football players in our area, was on a recruiting visit at Ball State. He didn't play. I, I think perhaps that affected him, certainly affected him talent-wise, and maybe a little bit in a depth situation. This is going to be a good Fort Recovery team. We're going to talk about them later on when we match them up in a regular season game a little bit later on in the show. Jefferson, they're 2-1. and one. They're at LCC, at Pandora Gilbo this weekend. I like their basketball team. Mark Brennanauer is a good point guard. They've got nice size. Tyson 6'4", Bratton 6'5", Rhodey 6'5", Long is 6'3". They've got some good basketball players. This will be a team at Jefferson we'll have to watch this year. All right, let's look at Temple and Perry, a cross-town rivalry, and a big win on the road for the Pioneers. 60-58, to another overtime game for Temple Christian. Brody Bowman, 34. 34 points, and he only had three threes, so he's scoring in a lot of different ways. For Perry, a lot of young guys out there, but they had a 27 to six advantage in the third quarter. Big comeback for them, and that's huge for young kids as, as they try to get them organized. Jamal Whiteside had 18 points, including two threes, and Logan Dre, that outside shooter, four threes, had 16 points to go along. That's a big win for Temple, but Perry starting to grow up a little bit. Yeah, Logan Dre and Whiteside, the only guys that played a lot on that team that went to Columbus last year, so they're trying to get everybody reorganized. Well, I got another good game on Saturday night, and that was St. Henry at Shawnee in a nice non-league matchup. How about the game that Tyler Schlarman had for St. Henry? Now they're going to win the game 62-48. Tyler Schlarman, he's a six-foot senior and 24 points, made two three-point field goals in there, 16 rebounds, seven assists, had a steal. He is a very, very fine basketball player. That's one player we're going to have to watch throughout our, our max season this year. Curtis Eulane helped him out as well. Curtis is a 6'3 senior. He had 18 points, including making four shots from the three-point line. He uh, had four rebounds, a couple of assists. A big weekend coming up for St. Henry. They are at Marion Local in Mac play on Friday. Then they play at home against a very talented Fort Laramie team on Saturday night. That's two good matchups for the Redskins this weekend. Shawnee, a couple problems for them. Tyler Moore missed the game. He's our, their high energy guy. And unfortunately, he was hurt a year ago. This time he takes a knee in the thigh in practice on Wednesday. It was so serious, the hematoma. Oh, hey, good, big word. Good That's the big word of the week, okay? Yeah. Uh, need to be drained, so they had to do a surgical procedure and drain that. They hope to get him back, but not quite sure when. He's obviously a very important player. And then Johnny Capella was in foul trouble the whole game. It's one of those nights, Mark, you get a couple, you set, you come back, get another one. He was never able to get on track. He's averaging 14 points a game and just didn't have much of an opportunity in this game. Riley Rosado led them in scoring the six-foot senior. He had 15. They are had defiance at home this weekend, uh, WBL play, and then they go to New Knoxville on Saturday night near the Shawnee Indians. Well, I hope Tyler Moore gets healthy. I like his uh, play. Me too. Yep. Another Saturday night game, Elida went over to Delphi St. John's and got a 50-44 win. 
That is a tough place for visitors to play. Eli hasn't won there a lot, but they got it this year. They stand at 4-0. Daniel Unruh led them with 19 points, but Skylar Smith came along with three threes and 10 points, and that's what Denny Thompson has been looking for, somebody to support Unruh with the scoring load. They got ahead in the third quarter on a 17-5 score, a 12-0 run, and they were able to hold on for the victory. Delphi St. John's now standing at 2-2. Two two. Shooting woes last weekend. Really, really rough night on Friday. Not much better on Saturday night. But Richard Kakuza had 11. Cotton Will had 11. Jared Wurst had 10 and 9 rebounds. So they're getting some pretty even scoring. But life after losing 6'8", Tim Krieger to Marietta has been tough for the Delphi St. John's team. But you can bet Coach Elward yeah. will get them organized. Well, it won't be long. We got them coming up in our preview. They're defensively very solid already. They get their shot going and watch out for them. Well, let's look at a couple teams had big weekends last weekend. One of them, first of all, Ottoville in the Big Green. Now, they're 4-0 now are the Big Green. They're averaging 75.3 points per game and giving up just 48.3. They've already made 26 three-point field goals in four games. Last weekend, they defeated Columbus Grove in a PCL game, 65-45, and then Ada on a non-league game on Saturday night, 83-51. They've got four guys averaging in double figures. Logan Kemper's at the top, and then Mormon, Tur Turbin, Bendley. Seaver averaged 13 and a half last weekend. They can score. Uh, they've got a non-league game we're going to talk about a little bit later on with Fort Jennings coming up this weekend and Spencerville as well, but a good start for the Ottoville Big Green. Well, here's a surprise. Ottawa Glandorf had a good weekend, all right? They won a couple of games and they scored some points also. On Friday night, 95 to 63 over Liberty Center. Five players in double figures. 17 points each for Bryce Schrader and Ethan White. Then on Saturday, they came back and scored 98 against Liberty Benton. They beat the heck out of the Liberty Oh boy, yeah, did, didn't they? Liberty Benton had 37. That's a win by 51 points. Again, five guys in total in double figures. Owen Hegel led him with 21 points. He had 18 at halftime. Jake Dybel, 20 points, seven rebounds. Richie Nelton, 16 points off the bench. OG made six of their first seven threes. Talk about a fast start. And then you think about all of this and remember that Jay Kaufman comes back in January. He was the player of the year in the WBL last year. It looks like the Titans are loaded and really explosive offensively. I get to do their game this Saturday with Lima Central Catholic and Jay Kaufman is listed on the roster when they sent out the beginning of the year. So you know he's practicing and getting ready to go and that'll be a real benefit for them as well. Hey, stat stuffers, All let's right. look at the guys that had great individual games, and you got the first one. Well, we try not to double up because we've had guys we've already talked about a little bit through, but Trevor Lambert from Kaleida, as Kaleida defeated Ada, how about this one, 64-18. to 18. This is a pretty good night. He is 10 for 10 from the field, including one of one from the three-point line, made both of his free throws for 23 points, had seven rebounds and a steal for Kaleida this week. That's a pretty good, a pretty night. good night. Clayton Overholt, Lincoln View beat USV 61-36. Clayton had 25 points, five threes, six for six from the free throw line. Came back on Saturday, beat Continental by 10, 46-36, and he had 12 of those points. So Clayton with a good double this weekend. New Knoxville got a win over Waynesfield this week, 57-42. Ben Lammers, the leading scorer for them. He had 22, six of those were on made us, made six three-point field goals for 18 points out of his 22. Good start for Ben Lammers and their win over Waynesfield. Cole Horseman. They got a double uh, victory weekend for Fort Jennings. They beat Antwerp on Friday, 62-42. He had 23 points and 13 rebounds. Came back the next night, and Fort Jennings beat Spencerville, 74-52, and Cole had 21 points. The Bath Wildcats start 0-2 at the tip-off, but Chad Fry takes care of business for them this weekend. They defeated Bluffton, 60-46. Chad Fry had 22 points, made a couple of three-point field goals. Then they came back and hung on for a win against Columbus Grove, 67-66. This time, Chad Fry had 36, including four three-point field goals in a loss for Columbus Grove. Blake Reynolds had 33, so Grove got some points out of him, just didn't have quite enough at the end. Daniel Unruh from Elida. In the four games that they've played, and they're 4-0, and I appreciate you pulling this up. Yeah, this how about good. this? He has 19, 18, 18, and 19. And then he has two threes, two threes, three threes, one three. And what word that comes to mind? <laughs> Consistent. That man is consistent. Doesn't every coach want consistency out oh, of their players, especially your best player? Oh, yeah, especially your best player. What you don't want is that guy to get you 12 this weekend and two yep. next week. That yep. balance is great. All right. Well, now we're going to move to our bright spot, and this is a couple of annual events, and Coach right. Shine has the first one from Taylor University. Well, Taylor University has what they call silent night. Now, this is the last home game prior to final exams. 
The students show up. It used to be they came just in pajamas. Now they come in Halloween costumes and everything else. And they set through the game in dead silence until they score their 10th point. And when they score their 10th point, this is a game here against Great Lakes last weekend. When they score their 10th point, watch what happens. The previously silent crowd rushes the court, which of course is a technical foul, but nobody, no <laughs> official is going to call that. And they celebrate and have a great event. And uh, part of this deal, Mark, not only when this is over, when the game is over, the president of the university and their staff pass out hot chocolate and cookies to all the students, and they read the Christmas story out of the book of Luke to the students. So it's not just basketball, as you can see. It's a great, fun event. I think this is the 21st year they've been doing that, and it's a great event for the silent night. My daughter went one year when it was pajama time. She was a student yeah. at Indiana Wesley at the time, and they went over, and you can see the Halloween costumes. Oh, so you get a lot of else. students from neighboring schools to oh, come, yeah, too. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, there's a lot of people It's, it's tough to get a ticket in that yeah. facility for that particular game. You can see all the costumes. and Man, I hope they warn the opposing team. They'd think that, oh, that people are coming to kill them. What's, what's really odd, every once in a while, I see a high school team will do it around here. If nobody yeah. knows it, you go, what's wrong with their students? They're not cheering. <laughs> what a great event That's that is awesome. at Taylor University. And another thing that our good buddy down at uh, the OHSAA, Jerry Snodgrass, came up with a couple of years ago is Military Appreciation Night, and you've got the date on that one. Well, Jerry's made it uh, January 19th this year, 2018. We know a lot of student bodies like to do a theme night, and Jerry is really encouraging everybody, not just from the students and how you dress and how you act, but to find a way to celebrate and appreciate our military personnel. It'll be January 19th of 2018, and we are encouraging everybody in our broadcast area uh, athletic departments, basketball teams, find a way to celebrate our military personnel on that night. Great success and participation. Schools all around yeah. the area last year, and we think it will even grow this year. Right. All right, time to go to the rules of the week. And Mark's going to talk about that area around the basket and the foul lane. I know when my dad played, he called it the key. Right. When I played, I call it the lane. Now my boys call it the paint. The paint. So you That's go right. ahead and well, tell us about that It used that to be called the key, and if we can put our graphic up, the reason is, uh, this is our current one where we're at right now today, but in the old days, it was only, now it's 12 feet wide, it was only 6 feet wide. And when it was 6 foot wide with the circle at the top of it, it looked like a key or a keyhole. Oh, yeah. And the old, we're old people, we remember doors that had, uh, you know, skeleton keys to them, and so it looked like a keyhole. And so it's called the key. And then we expanded it. There's it our original keyhole. You kind of see it upside down there where a skeleton key would go. Young people have no idea what a skeleton key right. is. We do, but that's okay. And then we went to the one we showed you just a second ago with the 12 foot wide lane. The NBA went to 16 feet when Wilt Chamberlain was playing and things got so wide and they had to move him away from the basket a little bit to keep Wilt from dominating the game. And then we also, there's the professional one that they use today. That's 16 feet wide. And then the, uh, the other part was the uh, uh, International League teams used to use a trapezoid-shaped area. They have gotten away from that. They now use what the NBA does today. So that is where the idea of key came from. How about paint? In 1977, Robert Indiana painted the floor at the Mecca, which is in Milwaukee, where the Milwaukee Bucks play. And he painted the floor two shades of yellow, and he painted the key area, the free throw lane area, red. There you can see it. Don uh, Nelson, who was coaching at the time, said I needed sunglasses to play in here. But that was uh, supposedly the first place to paint the key area or the free throw lane area and call it the paint. That's where it started. Now they all do it. Now they all do it. I'm, I'm an old guy. When I went to Bellevue, we were red, and we called that Blood Alley. Oh, and yeah. we're going to win Blood Alley. Okay. How about that? That's and, good. and then we played a team that had a yellow one in there. Those guys are cowards. They've got yellow in their paint area. So, <laughs> you know, you're coaching to use oh, all kinds of stuff. i got to find a way to motivate. Three quick rules very fast about the, the uh, key area or the, the free throw lane area. Um, you may not be in the area for more than three seconds when, without the basketball. Now, when does that start? If the ball is out of bounds, you can stay there if you want. If the ball's on the far side of, of the midcourt line, you can stay there. It doesn't start until the ball is in bounds and in the front court area. And then if you are a player with the basketball and you're making an effort to score, as long as you're trying to get that ball to the rim, the three-second count actually stops. You can stay there for four or five seconds as long as you are continually trying to get the ball to the rim. And then finally, and this is one that a lot of fans get upset about and whatever, when a shot is taken, nobody possesses the basketball. And until somebody secures it, there is no three-second count and a new one starts over again. There you go. All right, we've learned a lot more about the key, the lane, the paint. Just like last week, you learned about the backboard. If everybody would watch our show, we'd have a lot less fans complaining about the rules because they don't know the rules. In any case, good job on the rules. Go. We're going to take a break. We'll come back with our second segment, and Coach Shine's going to do the plays of the week. We'll be right back.
one. Welcome back. We are at the screen, and Coach Shine's going to break down some plays for us. The first one, start with the Fort Recovery Shawnee game. This is Fort Recovery and Dolphus Jefferson. Oh, okay. All right. But we know we talk about, you know, when you're in transition, it's a layup. It's got to be a layup. It's got to be a layup. Well, transition basketball can also be, can we get a shot, a good shot, before the defense is prepared to stop us? And that's what we have here with Fort Recovery. They're in the dark uniforms. First of all, you can see how they've done the wall up defensively, and they're just going to stop penetration dribble to the goal. But then watch what happens when they get to rebound and how they get a shot in transition before the defense is ready to play. This is Peyton Judy. He sees his teammate Kanapke on the three-point line, and he's got a three-ball airborne before the defense is prepared to defend. So it's not necessarily a layup. It's a heads-up play. It's running to the arc, which is a very good three-point shooter, and got rebounders on the backside, all three of them there. So they're getting a shot before the defense is prepared to play. Then here's our typical transition basket out of a steal by Wendell. The bounce pass from Derek Judy to Knapp Knapke again. This is a little bit more traditional. Here's the steal right there off the careless dribble. You normally want your guys to be a little bit wider than what the blue shirts were able to do, but still a great move to the goal and an easy basket for him. That's a little bit more traditional in fast break situations. Then I thought we'd look at a couple dribble moves by Tyler Schlarmer from St. Henry. Watch the long step he'll make right here to get past his defender. Long with a low left shoulder. He goes up and under the rim and scores. And then in transition, he'll get a basket, but a little bit unorthodox manner because he rebounds the basketball, off he goes, and then he's going to go with a left-handed crossover dribble right there to the rim and score. When you can make three-point field goals like he can do, uh, the drive we saw a moment ago, the crossover dribble right here, the left hand, and finish there. You can do both of those, my man. You can score points, and he's a rebounder. You can three, shoot the ball from the three-point line. That's a good offensive player right there. Looks like when the ball's in his hand, he needs some help on defense. One-on-one, hey, on one, he's yeah. going to be pretty tough. You better get, hey, help, help, help. <laughs> yep, you better be doing that in a hurry. All right, that's a good job. We always appreciate you showing us the, the plays and on big screen. We'll come back with our last segment. Join us back at the table right after this. All right, welcome back for the third segment. Good job on Plays of the Week. That's always you fun go. for you to get over there and do your thing. Hey, College Player of the Week, the old Where Are They Now segment. Now we're concentrating on our college guys because we've got so many. We've got so many. Having great yeah. years. Let's talk about a fella well, from Toledo. Let's start with this. First of all, Ryan Bruns, who was our Guy of the Week last week, was Player of the Week in the OAC this week. Yeah, another great week for Ohio Northern go. over there, so congratulations to him. Let's move on to one of his teammates from back in high school days, and that would also be from Marion Local, and that is the University of Toledo's Luke Kanapke, who is now 6'10", 235. That's a big fella, isn't it? That's big. Well, he goes to Marion Local. He's a four-year letterman at Marion Local, also lettered three years in golf. Imagine him hit a golf <laughs> ball. Long club, Oh, man, man that better be a big – all right, well – uh, his junior year, he averaged 14.1 points per game, seven and a half rebounds. They went to the regional finals. He's second team all Ohio as a senior. He's first team all MAC as both a junior and a senior. And then he goes off to the University of Toledo, where he's redshirted his first year as a Rocket. Last year, the 2016-2017 season, averaged 6.9 points per game, 4.2 rebounds, and shot 58.6% from the field and as 6'10 player, made half of his three-point field goals. His best game was against Evansville. He had 19 points, seven rebounds, three assists, and a couple of blocks. This year, the Rockets are five and four. They have a home game this week against Wright State on Saturday. Uh, Kanapke is averaging 12.4 points a game and only taking 8.8 .8 shots per game. Still getting 12.4 points per game, 6.8 rebounds. In their nine games, he's got 12 assists got 18 blocks. Last Saturday against Marshall, one of those shootout games, a 93-87 rocket win. He had 18 points, 11 rebounds. How about this a year ago? Academic All-Mac, a distinguished scholar athlete. He is majoring in management, made the dean's list, and something you and I like to hear, he's a member of their fellowship of Christian there athletes in the University of Toledo. You know, I know a lot of great high school players want to go to college and want to play right away. Yep. You know, and they, they, they want to pick a college based on that. He goes and he red shirts, gets bigger, get stronger. Right. He'd have never had a chance to do that if he'd have played as a freshman. Yep. He'd always been trying to catch up to the strength factor. Now he's got that girth and what a player he is. He really is. Having a great year for not going to be a force to Toledo R is in the Mac. Yep. All right. Hey, let's look at some of the great games we got coming around in our area this weekend. I get to start with a WBL matchup, their first 
week of league play. Van Wert, 2-0 at Wapak, 2-1. Both had signature wins last weekend. Van Wert beat rivals Crestview. We talked about that earlier. They also beat Lincolnview, and they are led by Jacoby Kelly. Jacoby can do it all. Hit the three. He plays great defense. He rebounds. He is the key. A lot of other good players coming along and helping him out. Wapak, they uh, they won a big game over Sydney. They won 54 to 40. But Sydney, and we saw some of the highlights yeah. preseason. Yeah. They are very very yeah. talented. And Wapak got on them pretty good at Sydney. That was kind of a surprise yeah. to me. Was it for you? But, yeah, the, the Wapak uh, did a nice job on four players. The point guard, the city, the guy we talked about being so good. Oh, yeah. He went off and got 20-plus, but they held the rest of them yeah. down, and Wapak wins the game. Adam Scott had 16. Gage Schenk had 14. So that'll be a great little lifter for the WBL. Van Wert at Wapak. They could both have good years. You know, this is a game where you like both coaches. You know, the two good guys, Doug Davis and Mark Bagley. And Mark Bagley's teams have struggled a little bit since he took over for Dave Fralick. Yeah, good luck to both coaches, but it's nice to see Mark succeed on this year, yep. too. Yep. All right. Well, let's move on to a MAC game this week. That's Delphi St. John's at Fort Recovery. Delphi St. John's, of course, opened up league play a week ago with Versailles, and that was an 18-point loss down at Versailles. Delphi St. John's comes in at 2-2. Two and two. They are 0-1 in conference play. You mentioned some of their players. Very balanced scoring. Metcalf, Worst, Kakuza, Houlihan, Will, Grothaus. They got a bunch of guys they can roll out there. They're always solid defensively. They're giving up just 45.3 points per game. Uh, um, uh, scoring 45.3 points per game, but giving up 41 defensively. So they're always very solid there. And Aaron Elwer, of course, does a great job defensively. They don't want to go 0-2 in the MAC this early, particularly with this being another road game for them down at Fort Recovery. Fort Recovery, we saw them last weekend. Michael Bayshore's team, he's a brand-new coach there as well. They're 3-0. Oh, two of those games were overtime wins over Greenville. And the one we saw earlier with Delphus Jefferson, they averaged 63 points a game. They give up 54. Their two best players are young. Peyton Judy's a junior. He's averaging 22 points a game. He's made 10 three-point field goals. And Kanapke is a sophomore. He's averaging 19 points a game. Then they fill in with a lot of guys around him. Vaughn, Wendell, Braun, Toby, Lenharts. Uh, they got another Judy, uh, Derek Judy, a freshman. They no got relative. A, that's what the cheerleader <laughs> told us. The cheerleader says he is not a relative. I don't Peyton's. believe it. We don't either, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway. Fort Recovery won this game last year, 56-55 in overtime. Expect another close one this time. DSJ down at Fort Recovery in MAC action. Let's go to the BVC. Arlington stands at 3-0, 1-0 in the league. They are at Van Buren, 2-1, also 1-0 in the league. Arlington on Friday beat Lipsick 43-26. On Saturday, they beat Temple Christian 57-48. They have 21 blocks as a team in three games. And it's not just an aircraft carrier in the middle That's that right. has 20 of them. They got three guys with five blocks or more. Ivan Berry's their leader with seven. He also averages 10 points a game. So no great leading scores, just even scoring, lots of big-time defense. Van Buren, they got a win 65-41 over Arcadia and 64-40 over Miller City. That's a good win. That's a good win. Miller City's going to have a good year, yep. so that is a good win for Van Buren. They're led by Matt Ayers at 15.7 points per game. But this will be an interesting game. This could really be a defensive battle. And you've got to be careful around the basket because the shot might be coming back in your face. Well, of course, Van Buren lost all those guys from a year ago. Their, their coach moved on, Mark Bishop. There's a lot of new things going on. Uh -huh. big, big win if they can pull one off this weekend at yeah. Van Buren. And then we got kind of a preview game of the PCL because Fort Jennings and Ottoville play twice a year. This is the non-league version, and it's at Ottoville. Uh, Ryan Schrader in his first year at Fort Jennings, they're 2-1. and one. They have a loss to Arlington that you mentioned. Then they defeated Antwerp by 20 and Spencerville by 22. They average 58 points a game and they give up 49. Horseman averages 19.3. Brandon Weary averages 13. I think those two guys have been playing for like 8 or 10 years. It's like been they, a Weary there since they, I I know, and, and they've been there. I think they've been playing since they were freshmen. I know Weary did. And then they fill in with guys around them. Trentman, Finn, Hur Hurston. Uh, they, they've got seven different players who have made at least one three-point field goal and a good year for Coach uh, Schrader so far. Who are they playing against? Their previous coach, Keith Utendorf, who mm -hmm. coached at uh, Fort Jennings for several years, then moved over to Ottoville where he teaches. We talked about them earlier. This guy's team off the 4-0. They're already 1-0 is Ottoville with a win over Columbus Grove. Uh, their opponents, however, only six wins and seven losses, so a little bit of a shaky schedule early for them. They've got uh, 26 threes made by five different players. Kemper, Mormon, we talked about those guys earlier. They will play a PCL game on January 26th. That will be at Fort Jennings. They're both in the same region, same district at Elida in the tournament. They may well match up three times. Wow. This will be the first of those. Yeah. All right, now we've got a tournament yeah. coming up over the holidays, the Lima Cupy Classic. <laughs> there you go. 
And we got some information on that this week. The first school from Macomb, Michigan, I took French, I can't pronounce it, Lanus Crusade. Sounds good. Okay, North. We gotta, we gotta get their uh, mascot and uh, just call them the Tigers. There you go. They're north of Detroit. How far north? They're 173 miles away from Lima. Mapquist says it'll take them three hours and 20 minutes to get here if the traffic is good and <laughs> nobody gets shot in Detroit on the way through town. Okay, well, that's one of the teams. They're gonna match up with Huber Heights Wayne on Friday night in the first game. Huber Heights Wayne off to a good start. They're 2 0. They have Beaver Creek on Tuesday night this week at Beaver Creek. They average 73 points a game. They give up 56. They've got a win over Pickerington North and Fairmont. They have a player, a six foot player named Darius Quisenberry. He's averaging 16 points a game, eight assists, five rebounds, two and a half steals, and blocks a shot. Wow. So he's off to Good a great player. start. Yeah. They've got a lot of big players. They have 10 players, 6'2 or taller. Uh, they've got a 6'6 player named the Christian Smith, averaging 15 and a half and seven rebounds. So Huber Heights, Wayne, they're probably the favorite in game one. Lima Sr. will play in game two. Uh, Toledo Woodward. Toledo Woodward has just a single win. That's over a non OHSAA school, a Cornerstone Christian. Uh, 102-38, they've lost three, four in a row since that time period, including a loss to Finley by 22, and they have a game Thursday night. Odd scheduling, they play at Thursday night at Toledo Scott, then they come to Lima Senior Friday and Saturday night, so kind of an odd schedule for them. Lima Senior's 3-0 going into their uh, track game on Tuesday night with Toledo St. Francis. That's a big matchup right away in conference play for them, by the way. Um, they have a win over Anthony Wayne in overtime and then at Clay and at Middletown last weekend when they opened up that new facility. The winners play on Saturday night, the losers play on Saturday night, the QB Classic, one of the better tournaments in our area. Yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. All right, well, the holidays are coming, but not before we bring you a lot of great games. Let's put up our broadcast schedule. There you can see December 15th on a Friday, got a Mac Girls game, and then that Van Wert Wapak game we talked about, Bath and Elida, again, the rematch from uh, Tip-Off Classic teams. Saturday, we've got a, several games coming your way, and the one that Mark talked about, OG and LCC, Wayne Trace Lincoln View, another backyard rivalry over that direction. Hope you catch the games. Hope you get out over the holidays. There's the Sunday. They just keep coming. Yeah. They, there's a wrestling invite that Andy will be going and doing. A lot of great broadcasting here. We hope you join in and get out to the gym. It's warm in the gym. Go to a game. For Mark and I, thanks for watching A Closer Look.